Hello everyone, this is Student Dave. How's it going? Today, we're going to be talking about the ever-popular field of artificial intelligence, and specifically, machine learning. Yeah, machines learning to do things. Scary and kind of cool at the same time. This one's learning to do the robot, so that might be scary. Anyways, uh, machine learning is kind of this new buzzword in the social world, but it's kind of been existent for a while in terms of uh, data mining and different things like that. But today, we're going to be talking about the very general idea of intelligence, right? Something doing something intelligently. And then talk about specific examples of how machines can do this with different algorithms like support vector machines and whatnot. Then in later tutorials, I'm going to go specifically through how you could implement this yourself in MATLAB. But today will just be a general introduction of what is an intelligent system and then specific examples in uh, computer algorithms. In order to understand artificial intelligence or machine learning, one must kind of first know what does it mean to know something? What is knowable? What is information? What is knowledge? And, you know, uh, bear with me on these semantics, but imagine that this is your universe. You live in this two-dimensional, flat, uh, random universe. Instead of flat land, you live in rand land, okay? And as you're walking around in this universe and you run into your buddies, what do you guys talk about? What do you guys think about? Do you describe what it's like to live in the upper left quadrant of the universe or the bottom right or what it's like going north versus south and east versus west? Is there anything informative or sensical you could say about what it's like for any of these things? Every pixel value is independently varying and random across space and time in this universe, and so there's really nothing that distinguishes or makes anything different in any part of the universe from any other. And so the very idea of moving north and south, intrinsic to this world, isn't really meaningful. There's no, nothing to talk about. There's no knowledge to be had in this universe. And that's kind of the fundamental idea behind this artificial intelligence or intelligence in general, is that, of course, first you need an intelligent machine to learn the structure in the universe, but there first needs to be structure in the universe. There needs to be something correlated some pattern, something that's relational in space and time between these pixel values in order for there to be something to be known. And that's fundamental to what machine learning and artificial intelligence is about. It's about learning structure in the data. And when there is structure in the data, and there is a system that can know it, like a brain, you can then start to look at these patterns and, and start to call them things. Maybe these are fireflies moving around because of their spatial correlations. Or maybe they're all arranged in a particular way that we might want to compress as lines or as moving lines at a 45 degree angle. Or maybe we want to combine them in a different way and call them a circle, call them a triangle. And maybe from that derive some kind of theorems about mathematics and geometries. Or maybe we might want to understand these lines differently, understand them as funny or lame or fit them into social constructs perhaps. Basically, what we're doing is combining a lot of correlated information across different modalities, and through this, learning the structure in the data, we start to create things like reality, start to create the notion of clouds and me and you and nature, and from that derive our own personal consciousness. And while that might be different from how computers do it, this might be fundamentally what everything's doing, is trying to learn the structure in the data. And with that, now let's see how computers can find structure in the data using machine learning algorithms. But first, we have to understand what is a vector and how is all data, including you and me, representable as vector values in a big, big space. And so, what is a vector? Well, a vector is a fancy word for a point. <laughs> really, that's what it is. A vector is a point. But it's a point in a space. So let's think, uh, let's use as an example uh, cats, because I like cats, at least they're funny, and then dogs. Wow, I actually was able to draw it. Here's a dog. His legs are moving a little bit differently, and he's got more of a square face. Oh my gosh, I can't believe, well, it's a rat dog, okay? Say we got cats and dogs, and what we want to do is we want to represent these cats and dogs as vect vectors, and so... What is a vector in this context? Well, imagine we're representing two attributes of the cat and dog. What we have here is maybe weight. Oh, weight, W-E-I-G-H-T. <laughs> weight, and maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe like tail length. Or, or maybe uh, weight and height. Okay, let's just do weight and height. Okay. 
And so what we do is we go around to our neighbors with a measuring tape and scale and start creeping them out by weighing and measuring the height of all these cats and dogs in the neighborhood. Maybe you got this cool like, ah, uh, oops, maybe you got this like cool like combined system where like we can measure and weigh them at the same time. I don't know. Anyways, you go around and you start to gather the height and weight data on a bunch of cats and dogs all over your neighborhood, freaking everybody out, uh, and making your parents embarrassed that they had you. Okay? <laughs> and so what have we done here? If we think about it for one second, what we've done is we've reduced all of the cat and all of the dog to points, to a point in a two-dimensional space. So here, like here, this cat or dog is represented as some height and some weight. This is some other cat or dog as some height and weight. And all these are cats and dogs. It's just a single point in a two-dimensional space. If we wanted to say something more, maybe we could have counted the number of legs of them, maybe the sounds they make, maybe some personality measure, maybe uh, maybe like how hairy they are, or maybe where they live. But all these features, these dimensions, we would just add them onto this into making some really high dimensional space, but it's still a point. It's a single point with many, many, many numbers describing it in different dimensions. Maybe, you know, height, weight, hair color, how loud they, the frequency of their crying, blah, 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 blah. But in the end, everything is a point. You're a point. I'm a point. Everything's a point in this hot, super potentially high dimensional space that's describing us as a point. Okay? So that's kind of the fundamental way in which you represent data for understanding this idea of structure in the data and machine learning is that you're a point in this high dimensional space or you're kind of this object with many features that you could describe it as and you could be represented at these points in this vector space. Okay, so that, that's just one way of representing the data and it tends to be a very useful way historically and is the reason you learn about vectors and do linear algebra and all this stuff. Okay, so we now have our data, right? And so what we're trying to do with this uh, approach, with this machine, is you want to be able to pump this data into the computer and have the computer determine if it's a cat or a dog. So us humans, we have many, many features to look at when we're looking at a cat and dog and different across different modalities. And so it may be the case that height and weight aren't very good. Maybe they're not well-structured data. But that's our goal is to look at the structure of the data. So let's go ahead and call our cats red, right? And let's circle all the data points that happen to be cats. So all the animals with this kind of like, uh, we're going to say high weight, high weight, low height, whatever. doesn't matter right now. Let's say these are our cats, okay? And now we're going to take our dogs. Here's our dogs in blue. And let's say these are all our dogs. Well, immediately, what do you think, right? We can see that there's structure in our data, with, without a doubt, very easily. But... That's us. We're using our visual processing system that's super advanced and things like this are just really easy for us to see. What we want to do is find out computer programs that can either draw a line between the data or maybe figure out the relationship, relationship between data points to saying all these are next to each other or whatever. But basically what our computer is going to try to do in this this uh, kind of supervised learning, I'll tell you more about those things in a minute, but basically take this input data, this data with labeled uh, descriptors, is it a cat or a dog, and use that to then figure out if there's a way, by learning something about the relationship between these points, that I can then take in a new variable, a new point somewhere, a new point here, a new point here, and be able to accurately determine with some probability or some certainty that that in fact is a cat or that in fact is a dog. And that's exactly what machine learning is all about. In this case, we're doing a supervised learner, but there's many ways in which you could learn structure in the data that is somehow informative to a system in a particular way. But that's the goal. That's what you're doing in machine learning, is you're learning the structure in the data. You know, it could have been different. Let's take, for example, say we weren't looking at height and weight, but we were, in fact, looking at, um, I don't know, weight and maybe hair color and hair length. With hair color and hair length, it might look like this. That if we, you know, we try to look at the, each of the points, there isn't any real pattern in the data. That is, there's no, like, line I could draw or maybe cluster I could find that kind of uniquely picks out cat very nicely, nor one for dog, right? And so... 
that's kind of the, the issue, right? Is that if your data is not very clean or separable or clusterable or somehow groupable, if there's no structure you could find that's uniquely uh, descriptive of the cat versus dog, well, it would be very hard to find a way to separate it, even with a really good training algorithm. Like, imagine I zoomed in on the cat here and zoomed in on the dog here. You know, I'd have a very hard time distinguishing cat versus dog, just as the same way this program would, because I don't have very good data or good features to work with. And that's kind of the fundamental thing, right? Imagine you're in a classroom where the teacher isn't teaching very well, but you're very focused, well, you're not going to learn very well. In the same way as if you're not listening and the teacher is explaining very well, that is, there's very distinguishable ideas, then you would learn, uh, then you still wouldn't learn because you're not paying attention. So you need both. It's kind of two sides to the coin of learning. In this case, we're looking at a classifier, but there's many ways in which learning structure and the data can play out beyond just a classification. Say, for example, you wanted to do uh, fit a line to predict something. Say, for example, we wanted to figure out the running speed of different uh, of four-legged animals, so we combine these animals, right? And what we have is we have this is like position, and this is like time, right? And then you got these points like this, right? Well, then what that you what you could then do is you could then fit a line to this. This would be called regression, right? And then if we had a new point. Let's say, for example, we had a new point. Ah. We had a, a new point, say here or here. Well, we could predict, you know, how the where the position will be later on. Where the position will be later on if we started here. Well, the position would be here at a different time. And so regression is kind of a, a different take uh, looking at continuous data and prediction. But the fundamental idea is the same, that these white points are all representing our data. In this case, we have two-dimensional data of time position. And what we're doing is we're fitting some function to that data. But what we're trying to do is pull out the structure of the data. We want to know something about the relationship between these points. And from that, by learning a relationship between them, in this case, learning the regression line, we can then, you know, generalize and have some predictive value and maybe uh, compress the data into a single function rather than have memorized every one of these points. But that's what, again, what machine learning is. And that's what learning is. It's, is there a structure in the data? Can we learn the structure in the data? And if we can, we know something about the data that we could then use for prediction, for description, for compression, whatnot. Okay? Um, and so what we're going to do now is talk about the different types of learning algorithms there are out there that help fit these functions, draw those lines, find those clusters. Okay. So in general, there are kind of three types of machine learning algorithms, but, you know, the lines kind of blur between different styles and, and algorithms. But in general, there's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. I'm going to go through some examples of each of these. You know, there's like these formal descriptions, but you know I don't like that. We'll go through examples. And then I'll show you in the later tutorials how we could implement these in detail in MATLAB. So in the first case of supervised learning, um, their particular examples are regression and support, ve support vector machine that we'll be working with. But in general, what you're given is you're given data, like in the cat and dog, we're given the height and weight. But then you're given a label. Here we're given, say, some independent variable and then some label dependent variable. And what you could then do is use these, these algorithms, support vector machines or regression, to support vector machine to draw a line and classify the data and regression to build a predictor line. And what that'll then do is give you tools for new data to classify or predict the next value. Take, for example, text classification or fruit classification. Basically, what you're doing in each, in each case is you're given pictures. Given a bunch of pictures of numbers of people writing them down or a bunch of pictures of fruit at different orientations and depths. And what you then do is you have somebody go through and go, okay, well, this is a watermelon. This is a four. This is a three. This are, these are grapes. And from each of those labeled data, maybe we took out the color and roundedness, or here we took in the edges or darkness or maybe the overall length, perhaps. And using those features, labeled features, we try to find a line that separates the data or some line that, class, that you know, accurately predicts the next value. In this case, we'd be mostly dealing with support vector machine. And with all those labeled data, that's our training set to figure out what line we should draw. And then you go, well, you give me a new fruit or a new uh, number, handwritten number, and see among the features I got and with that classifier rule I have, what is it? Is it an apple, banana? Is it a four or a seven? And basically what you're doing is you're using that training set, that label training set, to then classify your data, 
for new data sets. This would be your testing set. In the case of unsupervised learning, well, what you're doing is you don't, you have the data, but you don't have the labels for the data. Here we've drawn labels on them, but this isn't in particular the labels that were given to us. They were inferred by using either K-means clustering or Gaussian mixture models. And in this case, all we're doing is saying, well, is there structure at all in the data? Is there a relational, uh, you know, associations and distances between these values that allows us to say, you know what, these all seem close to each other, but far from other groups. And so we can say, this is a cluster, this is a cluster, and so is this. We have three clusters. Or maybe we have four from this, who knows. The idea is that what you're trying to do with these different algorithms is to look for a structure just native to the data. And some people have done this for a, a lot of different research, but in this case, I like this one. This is where they are shining a light and trying to figure out what parts of the body are, are uh, the body of the fly, what part is the wings, like basically segmentation. And what they do is they threw that data into a histogram and then used a Gaussian mixture model and fit a Gaussian functions to the different attributes of the histogram and were able to find these kind of uh, groups of data. In particular, the body tend to have a distant, different histogram than the wings on average. And so if I look for just this histogram, this bump in the Gaussian, uh, in the double Gaussian, that's going to pull out the wings versus the body. And see, this is a case where we didn't know beforehand what these two bumps represent. We just said, are there two bumps in the data? Oh, look, there are. Okay, now we'll just take one half, the half that's associated with the wings. And so this is kind of unsupervised learning, where you're given data, and you're just looking in general for structure in the data, independent of any labeling. And in the last case, we have reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is all about learning the right policy of behaviors in a particular environment so that you get positive reward. And so this is what we do all the time when we're moving around in the world and making life choices. And it's also involved in games and lots of uh, robots and machines. In particular, there's the Markov decision process and dynamic programming. And I didn't put it here, but Q learning is a good one. I'll be going over that one. But it's good for finding um, basically a policy or a sequence of rules of actions given a particular environment towards getting some optimal value. So in this case, you know, say you want to get through this maze, you go here, go here, up, I got a wall, that's punishment, that's negative reinforcement. It's not explicitly labeled as like, you know, this is the wrong place to go. It's saying this hurt, this isn't as fun. And then you go this way and you get a positive reinforcement. And through time, by using these different algorithms, you could then find the optimal path. The same ideas apply to things like multi-armed bandit problems, or say you got these different slot machines and you don't know the value of each one. You don't know the payout for each one. Well, there's ways to create algorithms for the right way to, you know, test these different slot machines. You can't do it all at once like this octopus is doing. You only get one at a time. And you can figure out what is the optimal policy for exploring these different slot machines. Google, for example, instead of slot machines, is dealing with ads. And it's like, what ad do I need to give you, the user, in order to get you to click on it? Which ad has the highest click-through rate? I don't know beforehand. So there might be some optimal policy of displaying ads of different subtle word choices that will give, yield the most amount of revenue. And also, pathfinding is not really just about spatial systems, but it could be about figuring out what is a correct sequence of thruster commands on a spaceship, for example. That's just one example. But in general, this is reinforcement learning. These are different programs for that. Then I showed you the unsupervised and the supervised learning. And in the next tutorials, I'll be going through the MATLAB implementations of each of those in, high, in a lot of detail. Okay? All right. Thanks.